and good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today, we will be talking about the power of engaging digital experiences. And to dive into that conversation, I'm joined by Ryan Brown from Saros, along with Paige Gildner and Sharon Shapiro from Blue Core. They are all experts on creating engaging virtual experiences. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Um, before thanks for having us. To the presentation, thanks for being here. Um, we will do brief introductions, um, but first, a shout out to everybody watching and tuning in. We'd also love to know a little bit more about you. Um, you'll see a chat function on the left-hand side of the screen. It would be great if everyone could head there now and drop in where they're tuning in from. We'll also have time at the end of this presentation for Q&A, so you can also use that chat box to drop in any questions you have throughout the presentation. So uh, diving in with intros. Ryan, do you want to kick us off? Oh, yes. I just saw someone's joining from Simpsonville, South Carolina. I'm in Greenville, South Carolina right now, so we're, we're pretty close to each other. Uh, glad you're joining. Um, I'm Ryan Brown. I work at Saros. I've been uh, head, of brand strategy, head of brand strategy there for a couple of years. And uh, as of late, I've been shifting a bit into an advisor and evangelist role for the company. Uh, but I've been working in digital marketing and experiential marketing for most of my professional career. Thanks for being here. Uh, how about over to you, Paige? Hi, everyone. I'm Paige. I'm the creative director at Blue Core. Um, as the creative director, I lead um, the design of tons of marketing materials for teams across the organization. So I work. Am I still there? You are. It looks like we're having a little <laughs> bit of a video, but you're back. OK, sorry about that. Um, but I work across the organization on the product team, the sales team, marketing team, and events um, to create design collateral um, and just work cross-functionally. Thanks for being here. And, and hello, Sharon. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Sharon Shapiro. I'm the Director of Content Marketing Planning at Blue Core. Uh, that covers everything from why we're creating content and who we're creating content for to how we actually create that content and then getting those messages out the door in front of the right people. Great. Glad you could all be here. Looks like we are having a little bit of video issues, so we will be working on that. Um, but while we do, Ryan, do you want to kick things off? Yeah, I'll absolutely jump into it. And uh, I hope everyone that's joining us out there today is doing well. I want to just begin by just saying how grateful and thankful I am to both Cred for hosting us today and really grateful to both Paige and Sharon who are going to be joining today. And when they get on later today, I highly recommend that if you're tuning into this webinar, you guys take notes. They're going to share with you a really powerful story of their journey about how they create engaging digital content. And part of the reason why today is so special actually the very last event that I got to speak at on stage in you know, it, as, a, as a live event with people was actually with Paige and Sharon uh, on my birthday in Scottsdale, Arizona uh, for an event there. And when we were talking about putting together a presentation again for CRED, I was so excited that they're able to join. Um, as we get started today, you know, I something I want to ask you guys. If we were in person, one thing I'd have you do it. I'd have you raise your hands to this question. And unfortunately, I can only see myself looking goofy here on the screen by myself. But I mean, imagine you guys are out there doing this. And the question I would ask you is this: How many folks tuning into this webinar have a desire to figure out how can they get their content, get their marketing, get their brand to stand out more amongst their competitors? And without a doubt, I know all of you guys will be raising your hands because this is something that not only us as a company, but when I've talked to customers and I talk to other folks and individuals, that's one of the most challenging things today is how do we get to stand out? There is so much happening in the digital space. Yes, Justine, I can see you raising your hand virtually. It is something that we're all stri striving and trying to do. And so today we really want to get into that a little bit of how do we get what we create as a company and specifically our digital marketing, how do we stand out amongst our competitors? Now, before I bring up my slides, there's something I want you guys to do for me as part of this. Think for a minute, think back to a time of any interaction that comes to mind. So the prompt is this, think of an experience or an interaction that you had with a company or a brand that comes to mind that stands out for you. Was it, it could be interacting with a product, it could have been when you ate at a restaurant, it could have been flying on a plane, it could be talking to your cable company. Whatever it is, think about something that comes to mind that stands out for you, an interaction that you had with a company or brand, all right? Take a minute, I'm gonna give you a minute, just I'm gonna be quiet for a second, let you all think about that. 
right now hopefully hopefully something comes to mind with that so i'm gonna go ahead and fire up my slides and i've got a question to ask you guys let's see here we go so the question i want to ask you guys is what made that particular moment that interaction that experience that you have stand out in your mind and frankly if you think about it, in any given day, you're having countless interactions with companies and brands and products. So what made that moment, that that interaction stand out as an experience that lived with you, right? We have experiences all the time, but then there's times where we have things that become an experience, something that resonates with us, right? Well, one of the reasons I'm gonna guess that it stood out with you, right, is, is the obvious, right? It was obviously memorable. If it's something that you remember, it's gonna be memorable and it's special. But for the sake of getting to the heart of the matter, I'm gonna bet it was one of two reasons for you, right? It was either outstandingly good, something happened that was, was really, really good or obnoxiously bad. And you can think about this in terms of, you know, we've all gone out to eat at restaurants many times in our life. And of the hundreds or thousands of times you ever ate at a restaurant, you don't remember all of those particular individual moments. But the ones that probably come to mind are the ones that have some quality about that, that, that stand out as memorable, as special. A lot of them probably fall in the outstandingly good or the obnoxiously bad. Now, this is really important for us to understand. Think about if we were to take a look at a timeline, right, of what we remember. So if what we really remember on the most part is either the obnoxiously bad or the astoundingly good, that we can use as marketers to figure out how do we get our content to actually stand out online. What is then true is there's a space that exists in the middle that we don't remember of the countless experiences that you have with brands, the marketing you interact with, most of it we don't remember. And here's also what's true. You might have had some very good restaurant experiences, right? You might have had some very good interactions with different brands, but do we remember very good? No, we remember outstanding and we remember out, uh, obnoxiously bad. So we have a very high bar if what we're looking to do is break through that noise and clutter, but we can use this. If I were to plot where I think digital marketing falls today, I think a lot of digital marketing actually falls in that space in between, right? Where we don't really remember it. There is some digital marketing and marketing for that matter that probably us as marketers are joining this, like that's kind of obnoxious when people do certain things. And we, we do remember some of those as well. And there are examples out there of really great outstanding marketing that sort of resonates with us and in interaction with companies and brands. But what I want you to take away is to be really excited about it is that outstanding is something we can all strive for. It is possible and attainable. And actually there's a lot of white space right there uh, in digital marketing for us to be able to do that today. But what I also think about is this middle section, I like to refer to it as the mediocre middle. There's kind of like a vortex that pulls us all in towards it. And again, if you could have a really, really good thing, but it's not gonna break out and stand out, those aren't the things that we necessarily remember. We need to strive for outstanding. One of the things I, I, I want you to think about this, if you're out there trying to figure out, well, what is everyone else doing out there? Well, if you do the same thing that other people are doing out there, it's not necessarily gonna cut through the noise by what we're talking about right now. And one of the traps that I find when it comes to folks working in digital marketing is we fall into this trap of doing the same old cookie cutter stuff over and over again. So what we need to do is avoid the mediocre middle and we need a new way of thinking about that. And that's what I wanna get you guys an opportunity to think about today. So if what I have on the screen here is a piece uh, like a PDF. If this is something that we see a lot in digital marketing today, the question I hope you all are asking is, can this, can this become a standout experience? How do I make this, my digital marketing content stand out more? And what I want you to think about today is shifting the way we do most of the content. Most marketers are creating content today and reimagine that and start thinking about that through the terms of actually creating standout experiences. And I want to introduce a term to you. You may or may not have heard it before, and that is experiential content. If you've ever hosted a party at your home before, you've probably thought about this. If you ever said, hey, I have folks coming over to a dinner and like when they arrive, I'm going to take their jackets and place the jackets here. I'm going to serve them this drink. We're going to have food at this time. I've got I made sure I have enough seating. I made sure I had enough food. You've actually thought about the experience that someone's going to have. I want you to start doing that for your content. I want you to start thinking about how is someone going to interact and engage with this, right? And so really what we're looking at, the content on the left, the most content that's being created for folks today, stuff like this is being written at. Like we're just writing at the people we're trying to create it for. The content on the right 
this was actually created for the content on the right is essentially the same content that was on the left, but the approach was taken to it was how can we actually create this into an experience that someone can interact with? Can we have the content unfold? Can we directly in click with and engage with? So what I'm hoping you're asking yourself is how can I go from most content to experiential content? And what I want to talk about now is the five levels of experiential content to give you a quick interview so that you can use this as tools when you go forward and start thinking about this with your own content as well. Now, the first three, if you're in marketing, I guarantee you are already doing this. If you're not doing these three levels, you probably don't belong here. You should probably get out, right? There is an opportunity always for us to explore these first three levels and do them better. For the sake of today, I'm not gonna go into much detail. There's a lot of things out there that you can learn about adding in visuals and narrative elements and the integrated elements, right? These are the aspects within marketing that we integrate into our content, be it a form, our call to actions, our different tools out there. What I wanna do to unlock the way that you think about being able to make your content into an experience, into digital experience for people, are in these next two levels. So the next level is interactive elements. And these are things that you can build into the content itself to allow people to click on, engage. You can open up new pathways and choose your own adventures. And level five are these immersive elements. And you've been to these websites before. You've seen this when you do special effects on scroll, different animations. Now, what these immersive elements do is they help heighten the connection of the universe of the brand, the universe of the product helps pull us into it. And I wanna give you two quick examples to illustrate this. And my whole point right now is, because we can't go super deep into all of these, is to introduce the concept to you so that you now have this as a frame of mind of something that you can create with when you start creating your digital content. So the first is interactive element. Now let's say I am putting together a blog post for the holidays and I have a bunch of different recipes that I wanna do. And I could write that blog post with like, hey, here's my top 10 different recipes for the holidays. Or I could create a quiz or something like this, right? Start off, do you have 10 minutes, yes or no? Who is your kitchen goddess? And this is a really fun, interactive way to get to choose different things. It actively invites people in, it gets you curious, it gets you to participate. But this is just a great example of using interactivity in it. Now, the other one I wanna show is just give a high level of immersive elements. And the first thing that I'm gonna show you is what would be like a standard typical product, PDF or a web page. And I've specifically removed any of the immersive or directly interactive elements for it. So you can just get a flavor for it. It's just, this, don't get me wrong, this is beautifully designed, right? It looks really good, it looks great. It's a really nice piece. We're used to sending out beautiful looking PDFs maybe like this. But what I wanna show you is, what if we took this and we added in the immersive qualities and what does that look like? So here that same pieces again, but now I've turned on a bunch of elements that are gonna make it a much more immersive experience from the way in which that engine animates in, we've got clouds moving, we got these planes being triggered when you hit there on that particular part of the stage, we got the rain, you can hover over the engine, you can interact and view into different portions of it. As we scroll down, the text and call the actions fade up. And we've got all this other excitement. So this plane's got a little bounce, it's got jet streams coming out of the back of it here. We've got an interactive map where the pins move in, you can click on these windows, all these things, you get it, you can see it firsthand. But this is just a flavor of how you can use both interactivity as well as immersive elements into it. So I'm so excited today because Paige and Sharon are gonna take you through their journey towards experiential content and how they figured out. But before they do, I wanna give you just one more quick example to hopefully ground this and how attainable this is for you. And so I'm gonna use an example of another brand company called CarGurus. You guys might've heard of them if you ever bought a used car or even a new car. They are one of the world's leading platform of being able to find and buy cars online. On the B2B side of the business, we uh, have worked with them before. Their goal was how do we get car dealers, right? We want car dealers who are looking to sell cars online and we have a platform for them. They had this workhorse of the PDF, which was a PDF guide to understanding the digital shopper. This was a high value asset that they use at top of the funnel to get new leads for their car dealers. So marketing, they took this PDF and they just reimagined this piece of it as experiential content, right? And what you're seeing here is that same as that content, but added in with those interactive and immersive elements. And they basically saw a doubling of the impact that the old PDF, which was their workhorse do in terms of leads and the influence on revenue. 
And so what I wanna summarize for you today with the opportunity when you start shifting from the way you're doing content and you start thinking experientially with experiential content are three main things. The number one thing that you all raised your hand, I know you did, you wanna be able to stand out and you can see it in those transformations that I just showed you from one to the other, it stands out. And it is one of the ways when you stop writing at and you start creating for, it's how you avoid the mediocre middle and how you can start establishing and creating a really strong brand differentiation and unique awareness of what you're creating. Two, I gave you one example. There are hundreds of examples when people have transformed from that sort of static traditional content, cookie cutter content, and made it more immersive and interactive with experiential content that the sales and marketing performance and benchmarks always go through the roof. There's tons and tons and tons of examples. I've seen all of this firsthand. And then lastly, it's part of a healthy and engaged community beyond wanting people to stand out. The other thing that we want to do is we want our customers, our prospects and our communities to lean in and engage with us, right? A bit more. And this is a key part of that. And it really invites and empowers us to do so. So the last thing that I have here before we bring on Paige and Cher and to share their story and their experience, I want to help break through any limiting beliefs that you guys have. You might have looked at what I've shown you on screen and you're like, okay, yeah, that looks great, but like, we can't do that. Like, that looks like I need an expensive agency or I need a developer. And it was funny, a year ago, I used to like get up on stage and be really nervous and like, well, and then we have this thing called Seros that we could do. And I've decided, screw that. Here's the thing, if I had a magic potion that would make you like say young and beautiful forever. And I was like, yeah, you could have it if you want. Or, you know, instead you could drink a lot of water and use moisturizer, or you could have this magic potion that does the thing that works. I've just decided in 2020 where we're at, companies need this so badly now. The thing I wanna to say to all of you guys is all those examples and stuff that I've shown you, and you're gonna see it firsthand with Paige and Sharon, it is no longer a nice to have, it is now a need to have, and it is something that is 100% possible to scale without needing expensive developers and web agencies. And really, that's where Saros has come into play. We've built a platform that helps people do that. And I am proud to share and tell all of you guys out there that if you're interested in this, if you're looking to stand out, if you're looking to create remarkable experiences, this is absolutely something you should consider. And I don't want you to just take my word for it. I know I work for the company. I could not be more excited to share the journey that Paige and Sharon took themselves to be able to go on this. And they've got some really deep insights from as the marketing and the design perspective. Take notes, you're gonna learn a lot from them. I'm super excited. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. And it is my pleasure to introduce Paige and Sharon. Thank you, Ryan. I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, we're really excited to be here with you all. Hopefully everything works, let me see. Great. Okay, um, so I just wanted to reintroduce myself. I'm Paige Gildner, the Creative Director at Blue Core, and I'm joined by my colleague, Sharon Shapiro, who's the Director of Content Marketing and Integrated Planning. I'm gonna kick it over to Sharon to just talk a little bit about our collaborative process at Blue Core and how design and content work together. Yeah, so like Paige said, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our relationship. But first and foremost, the really important thing to know about Blue Core as we go into this is that we're a startup. So our resources are really lean. Uh, whether it's our team or our budget, we do everything we can to be super efficient with what we have and really maximize our reach and make us look 10x our size in the market. Uh, and, and we're going to share a little bit of how we do that today. Uh, so the relationship between our content and design teams is really important. And it sits to, for us, that sits at the intersection of experiential content. Uh, traditionally, organizations have had a really clear divide between content and design. Uh, I think we're all familiar with a, an organization where content creates copy and then there's a clean handoff over to the design team. The design team has no idea what's coming down the pipe. And once that handoff happens, the content team doesn't know what the designers are doing with what they've created. Uh, for us at Blue Core, that could not be further from the truth. Exactly, and we don't want to work together that way either. Um, we wanna have a really shared and strategic collaborative process. So in order to do that, um, our teams engage really early. We partner in content development. We're constantly brainstorming new types of content and new ways to share content. And we partner really closely and fre frequently sync, I mean, we probably sync every single 
every other day, um, be it over Zoom or Slack now that we're remote. Um, but we're just constantly thinking on milestones, shared goals, um, anything that we want to work together on and collaborate on for content and design. And this leads to that really shared creative process. So about a year ago, um, similarly to, you know, to Ryan kind of talking about what experiential content is, we discovered the power of experiential content um, in a session very similar to this one at a conference. So Sharon and I were sitting there, we were contemplating some of the challenges of Blue Core at the time, which were we didn't have a web developer, we didn't really have the capacity or the tools to create anything other than static PDFs and static content for the really passive consumer. And our business was also rapidly changing. We had just launched a new product line, we were growing really quickly at the company, and we wanted to find a way to create content that really matched the rapid pace of acceleration that Blue Core was was experiencing. So when we saw, you know, what Theros could do and what these types of really experiential and engaging um, tools can could do for our content, we were instantly hooked. And all we wanted to do is kind of jump in, get to the drawing board and start creating as quickly as we could. And this led to us having a huge mind shift around how we created content. As Paige said, we previously created pretty passive content. We had no opportunity for our prospects or customers to raise their hand tell us what they were interested in, and then choose to engage with us in that way. Along the same lines, we had no idea how people were engaging with our content. So we would know if someone filled out a form, but we wouldn't know what happened after that. Did they even open the piece of content? Uh, and if they did, did they get past page one? Uh, or did we have this amazing infographic a couple pages in that everyone absolutely loved, and that was a signal we should create more content like that? We just had no insight into any of that. Experiential content has changed all of that for us. So now we have the opportunity to create unique experiences that, fo that foster really active engagement. Users can choose their own adventure and engage how they want. It also gives us a ton of information so we can make our marketing even better. Uh, we now know what people are engaging with, so it allows us to see what's working and what's not and make adjustments to what we're doing accordingly. Uh, we can also use the engagement data to see what people are interested in and tailor their experiences with us based on that. So for example, someone can you know, self-select within an experience to say they're interested in topic A versus topic B, and we can then slot them into the campaigns that we have running based on that. And one example of an interactive piece of content that we created that allowed the user to kind of personalize their experience was this um, experience you're seeing on your screen now, which was called the Content Concierge. So every September previously, Blue Core had a big annual in-person summit, and we knew that we wanted to create a piece of experiential content to launch during summit to the attendees. So the way that the Content Concierge worked was an email was sent out to all of the attendees during the event. Um, the attendees were, you know, filled out three very easy questions that, you know, you kind of are seeing as it scrolls through here. So what are they most interested in? What type of content? If they're more of a strategic or tactical thinker, and if they're in that type of role at their company, and then what their retail vertical was. Based on their responses, the content concierge curated this piece of blue core content that they could actually pick up at the event that day. So it encouraged this engagement between the attendee and someone who worked at Blue Core to go over, start the dialogue about the piece of content, and allow that relationship to begin. Um, another awesome thing about this particular piece of content is we made it evergreen. So it it extended beyond just that summit. We saw that it was a really um, good touch point, a really good way to kind of engage and personalize with people and to just learn more about them right off the bat so we could better tailor the content and the emails and the communications they were receiving from us from us afterwards. Um, so the content concierge was amazing for us because we saw a 93% higher interaction rate and an 80% higher dwell time on this piece of content than anything else we had ever created. So just by creating this simple piece of experiential content for our annual event, we saw some really great results and were able to start those really personalized conversations from the get-go. And the content concierge is one example of many that we've been able to see results like this. And it's shown us that there are truly unlimited benefits for the business when you master the content experience. 
for us, that's really centered around being able to test, iterate, and optimize quickly. That way we can understand what our prospects and customers are most interested in and where they fit into our campaigns. The really important piece of this is understanding and listening to the data and making changes based on that, rather than just assuming that something is going to work and going for it. Uh, in doing so, we can create these really clear paths for engagement that accelerate our the journey of our viewers from prospect to customer. The best part is that with Seros, all super low risk. Because we can get into the platform and do it on our own, we don't need to cobble together resources or waste time talking back and forth with a developer where we've seen that things can often get lost in translation. Instead, we're really empowered to go in, do it ourselves, and make changes quickly so that we can test and learn. This really minimizes the risk of trial and error. We're able to, to go for something and see if it works and make adjustments very quickly if it doesn't. So another piece I wanted to take um, everyone through today was this tool that Blue Core created called the Email Performance Calculator. And this is a great example for us because this was one where we really were dedicated to the testing and learning um, and seeing kind of how users were engaging with this piece of content, if they were experiencing it the way that we had anticipated that they would. Um, so what you're seeing right now is version one of this email performance calculator. So we launched it at the end of 2019. The idea was the user would fill out their industry, their average order value, and the annual email volume of their email program. And then by generating their benchmarks, they could measure their program against the best benchmarks for their business. We thought this was totally straightforward. You know, everyone would fill out the form fields, click that generate your benchmark now CTA and get some really great information. But after monitoring this experience for a few weeks, we realized that users were not engaging with this tool in that way at all. And actually, we were seeing a really high drop off rate. So what would happen is someone would come to the experience, they would fill out their three form fields, and then it's like they didn't know where to go. They weren't generating their benchmarks. They weren't getting a free consultation and customized action plan. Um, and we couldn't really figure out what was going on. But we took a step back. And we realized there was some confusion here. We actually have, you know, dueling CTAs on this right when you land on this experience. And the output of what the user will receive is not clear. Um, on top of that, from a design perspective, there's a lot of text right above the fold, which, the which sometimes contributes to um, a drop off in the user. And we wanted to reevaluate where we were going with the calculator and how we could get better results. So... What we did was we created version two. Um, this was all based on data and insights that we could see from the, in the back end of the Saros platform. We could see how users had been engaging with V1 and make those necessary tweaks. We eliminated a lot of the text above the fold. We moved it further down in the experience. Um, we changed the dueling CTAs so that it was just one clear CTA underneath those form fields. And these changes we were allowed to, you know, we were able to do them in-house without the help of a developer. Like Sharon mentioned, we didn't have to cobble together a bunch of resources to figure out how to make this work. And after making those changes, we saw a 25% in interaction rate increase and a two-time click increase in click-through rate just for making those few tweaks. Um, so that's really the power of a tool like Seros is when you make changes on the back end to an experience, it automatically updates wherever the experience lives and you can track and you can track your changes and the insight and the data that are coming out of those changes to really understand your user better and to strategically inform the design of your experiences. So as Ryan mentioned, interactive digital experiences are not a nice to have anymore. They're really critical in today's in, in the state of the world today. So gone are the days of these big um, interactive engaging conferences where you travel and you get to network and you know you get to go into you know halls with vendor booths and really just engage, meet other people who are doing cool things. Everything now is fully digital. And there's a big change in what being fully digital means in 2020. We're at Blue Core, we're still evaluating what it looks like to create a virtual event that has that same flair and inspiration and educational component that, that a conference or an in-person conference has had previously. 
So a lot of things feel like they're missing now that we're not traveling to big conferences and we're not having those networking and engagement opportunities anymore. Um, but at Blue Core, one thing that we are certain of is that unless we fully lean into creating exceptional digital interactive content for the year, we will not be able to stay ahead. Um, Seros is a tool that we've been on board with for the past year and a half. We've seen how it's transformed our content. And now we're in a place where we're thinking about how we can use these types of platforms to create really immersive virtual experiences that don't just feel like, you know, a typical Zoom meeting or something like that. So now, as Ryan mentioned, I'm just here to kind of, you know, hone in on that same thought is now is the time to introduce these virtual digital experiences into your marketing and design content plans, because that's, that's what you need to go beyond the status quo. So what you're seeing now is actually one of our newest digital experiences that we call the retail data dashboard. This is something that we've put together uh, in light of everything going on. And we've used it across marketing channels, but especially within digital events to really bring that interaction to light. Um, so we've all seen firsthand how consumer shopping has essentially been turned on its head with everything going on. Bluecore is really uniquely positioned within that because we work exclusively with retailers. So we were seeing a ton of data about how shopping trends were changing. We wanted to get those out there, but we knew that we had to do so in a highly engaging way to stand out and really grab people's attention. We also knew that timing was essential here because the data was super time sensitive and people didn't want data from a month ago. They want the data from yesterday. Uh, so the result of what we did is what you see here in our retail data dashboard. And it's been a big hit so far. This is a really great example of engagement and relevance coming together in a single experience. And that's only really possible for us thanks to the ease of use of Saros. So first, we were able to stay relevant by spinning up this experience extremely quick with, quickly. That way, we could participate in this time-sensitive conversation. Second, we were able to make it really engaging for viewers by allowing them to interact with the data and drill down into the different types of data that make mo the most sense for their brand. So someone can come in and look at data by retail vertical and also look at different types of shopper interaction data. So if we have someone in the apparel industry who's really focused on customer acquisition, they can drill down into the benchmarks that look specifically at that. Finally, we've continued to update this dashboard weekly as we collect new data. That way it stays relevant and up to date at all times. And that's been huge for us in making this a long-term piece and not just a one and done piece that has a shelf life of a week or two. So I know what you're thinking. This is a lot, uh, but we're only about a year and a half in and we're still just scratching the surface. There's also a lot of takeaways that we've learned over the past year that we want to share with all of you today. So number one is the importance of building a business case and getting buy-in. Digital experiences are never going to reach their full potential if you don't have visibility for them and support within the organization. One of the best ways that we've found to do that is to do a proof of concept. That way we were measuring based on actual value and not just expected value. So in doing a proof of concept, our best tip is to have a really clear outline for the program that you want to deliver and what you plan to do within the proof of concept timeline. That way you have a lot of clarity around whether or not the trial was a success. The other important thing is to prioritize what you're doing. It's a whole new world when you get involved with digital experiences and if you don't go in with clear priorities, it's kind of like going to the Cheesecake Factory hungry and staring at a 64 page menu. You just end up with way too much on your plate. For us, this meant knowing what our business needed and going for it. We started with some really big projects and did fewer of them rather than doing a lot of smaller projects because we knew that that's what would deliver the biggest benefits for our business. And that's really important for anyone who's getting started with digital experiences. You have to know what's going to work best for your business and then just go for it and don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we'll hand it back to Bethany. Thank you, everybody. 
Um, it was really great to hear both of your perspectives on that. Um, and to everyone watching, we are going to start with a quick Q&A for the last 10 minutes. So if you do have any questions, please go ahead and drop those in the attendee chat and we will make sure we address those. <clears throat> um, I think one thing that is top of mind for everybody right now is that, first of all, you guys have been digital experience evangelists, evangelists for a long time. Um, but, it's a mouthful now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but now with COVID, things have shifted to where it's a necessity, right? So for people who have already been so passionate about this, what's shifted for you guys? Has anything shifted? Um, and how are you looking at experiences differently now that we're in a COVID world? So I'm just going to kick that to all of you and see if anyone wants to take it. I'll go. Sure. Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> we're going to do this at the same time. Um, a visual comes to mind when I think about it. I mean, like, I, you know, I feel like I've been out there for a while being like, you guys, you got to worry about experiences. You got to worry about you know, like your digital experiences. And people are like, yeah, I probably should, but this is how I do it. This is what I'm doing. And then, like, literally, the visual is like COVID came in like a wrecking ball and just like smashed the world of everyone together. Uh, and now people are like, oh, that thing that I said I should be doing for a while, like, I know I need to be doing now. And a lot of people are scrambling to figure that out. And something that, you know, Paige and Sharon were talking about earlier, which is true, is we do have a void that was created from the in person events that we do need to figure out how do we actually. Make this is great, but I'm sad that I can't see all the attendees and get you guys to interact and raise your hands. Um, ooh, I don't know if I'm frozen for you guys. I got to make a really weird face where I'm frozen there. Um, but I, what I want to say is one other thing is I think what Paige and Sharon were getting at is there's many different touch points where people interact with us in the digital space. And we need to start thinking from just like, I'm running a playbook of marketing, which has a bunch of cookie cutter content out there and shift into of these different touch points where I'm creating content. How do I actually focus on making those more engaging, more interactive and think about those touch points as experiences. So that was a long winded answer to basically say what you were saying there, Bethany, but that's the big shift I've seen is people are all, all of a sudden like, oh crap, I get it. I need to be doing this now. Yeah, and I think even for us having already been doing it, there's a renewed sense of urgency around creating these types of digital experiences. When we were doing them before, it was viewed as really great, very nice to have the icing on the cake. Now this is the bread and butter of what we need to be doing. Yeah, it's definitely not something that you can choose to do anymore. I love that you guys talked about the events too, like even this would be so different in person than being on a webinar. So yeah, just totally different. Also super interesting that you guys talked about all the data that you're seeing when you're um, rolling out these experiences. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about that. And if you guys learned anything interesting while you looked at this data, maybe we can start with you, Ryan. Oh, well, I, I'm excited for Paige and Sharon to share, but what I what I will say as I when I came to when I came to Saros and I start thinking about this, because I've been in digital marketing for a while and Paige and Sharon alluded to this, and I think the visual that they gave folks, if you didn't catch it out there, it's brilliant. It is PDFs are like a black box, but a black box that you can't access. It's like we've got this, we put it out into the world and then I have no idea. And I used to joke that like, I imagine when I put out this PDF, people are sitting up in their bed at night, like scrolling through the pages of my PDF, eating popcorn, binging on all my content. Like that's not true, but I honestly have no idea if they are or not. But one of the things by shifting that to experiential content and whatnot, you actually have the ability to see, are they looking at, when are they looking at it? What are they clicking? When are they engaging? And I'm very curious from Paige and Sharon to know what, if anything, you guys had when you started seeing that data, what came to mind for you guys? Yeah, there was a ton of insights that came from that. Uh, Ryan, I think you hit on the head when you said, you know, you hope people are sitting up at night and binging on all your content. I mean... I would love if that were the case. Uh, realistically, I know it's not, but I don't know what it actually looks like or I didn't before Saros. Uh, so having that insight and being able to see what we want to know what's working and what's not has been really interesting because there are certain things that we thought would be a home run and other things that you know we just kind of threw in there just because and they ended up being the, the star of the show. Uh, 
that has taught us that we really can't assume anything. And it helps us instead of we, we came from a place of looking inside out and the data from Seros has really helped us look outside in to understand what people really want from us and then be able to deliver more of that. So that's been the, the biggest eye-opening thing for us, I think. Definitely. And in that piece that we shared with you, the data dashboard that's based on retail data amidst COVID, um, we on the design team have done a little bit of analysis about how users are engaging and seeing what users are coming back to check and what verticals are um, getting the most engagement and impact. So even knowing that about how people are using that tool is so beneficial for us as we continue to put out more information about retail trends based on the current state of the market. You guys aren't staying up late reading PDFs and white papers late into the night? I, Only I sometimes. I collect them like baseball cards. I don't open them. So I just keep them <laughs> because I'm hoping they're going to be worth something someday. So that's why I do it. Very rich someday. <laughs> um, I also thought it was really interesting, um, Paige and Sharon, how you talked about um, the steps you took to start using experiential content. I think especially for anyone who's listening who may be working for a startup um, as a startup yourself who dove into this, do you have any tips for anyone looking to jump into experiential content, especially now that it's not just something you can choose, something that you need to do a little bit more? Yeah, I think uh, for us, the proof of concept was just the biggest thing. Uh, we had some initial buy-in beforehand that aired on the side of curiosity more than anything else. And the proof of concept was really able to solidify that and grow the visibility of what we could do within the organization. Uh, so that, that was really important. We were super strict about our proof of concept though, in terms of laying out exactly what we plan to do, how we plan to do it, and then what we wanted to achieve. And if we didn't achieve those things, we weren't going to go forward. Uh, and I think that being strict in that way was actually very helpful because we, we set out those things ahead of time and there were some people who thought, okay, that's not going to happen. And it did. Uh, we were able to achieve those things. So that made a huge difference for us. I think the the other part of that is you can't just do the proof of concept in a bubble and see what works and what doesn't. You have to socialize that within the organization and make sure that people are aware of what you're doing at every step of the way. You want to promote it ahead of time, promote what you're doing while it's happening. And then once you do get the results and they are ideally everything you hope for and more, you uh, really have to go and beat the drum on that even harder. Yeah. And one additional thing to add is that we have really leaned into all the tools and the educational materials that Saros offers as we try and understand how to um, incorporate this type of content into our marketing plan. So even um, at Blue Core, as we've been evaluating what the event space looks like right now and how to create this virtual event um, experience that really kind of feels like you're in an in-person conference. Um, we've been leaning into things that Saros is offering as well. Sorry, I think I may have frozen there, but oh, hope no. you caught some of that. Well, we caught all of it. Thank you. Um, we are running close to the end here, but before we sign off, I know we talked a little bit about that mediocre middle and shooting for the best, but sometimes landing among the middle. And then the other stuff you remember is really that stuff that is the really bad bucket and that marketers really have to take those risks to hit the really great bucket. Um, wondering if any of you have ever shot for the really good and landed amongst the really bad. Um, or if you have any lessons learned or anything you could share about how to either turn that around or end up in the really good angle. We all start with you, Ryan. Sure. Well, you're nearly saying this quote that I loved as a kid growing up, which is uh, shoot for the moon. And even if you miss, you'll land amongst the stars. And I know a little bit when I was talking about that mediocre middle and I said, if you're if you're even if you're very good, you're not necessarily outstanding. Now, not don't despair, like very good still gets like better results. If you're just good, 
instead of very good, you get poor results. Like good is hard to stand out today. Very good gets you better. Outstanding is where you get it. So you have to at least aim for it, right? So back to that quote. The other thing on the flip side, and I just want to summarize this because you were mentioning, it's taking that risk. You've got to be willing to shoot for the moon, go for outstanding, embrace it. In the same way that like, you know, very good isn't always like memorable. You know, you might get okay results. The same thing with like, you try something it failed it's not going to probably be obnoxiously bad if you are putting something from your heart and out there and taking risks most likely it's not going to be viewed as obnoxious so if worst case scenario maybe it doesn't perform maybe it misses the mark people aren't going to remember that there's too much stuff out there anyways so shoot for the moon go for it you've got to take a risk um, I personally have not had an experience where anything was obnoxiously bad I've had some things that were like a swing and a miss People don't remember that. What they do remember, though, is when you go for it and you do have something that hits and have something that clicks, and you've got to go and got to keep putting yourself out there. So that would be my encouragement is shoot for the moon and land among the stars at the very least. Like our favorite poster from childhood. Yes. <laughs> um, Blue Core, anything to add? Um, I think we shared a little bit about that email performance calculator and how we learned from that. And that's really a mindset that we, you know, kind of share in our collaboration and how our teams work together. We don't have a fear of failure. We don't have a fear of criticism. Um, and I know it sounds cliche, but I really just consider those learning opportunities, especially um, in the design world where you're constantly prototyping and um, changing the angle of, you know, how you're solving a design problem. Um, so I really just think that they're all learning opportunities. I would echo what Ryan said. We always think that people are going to remember when we mess up, but they don't care. Um, and, you know, unless it's directly impacting them, of course, but I think it's just all a learning opportunity and um, a chance to reevaluate and um, strategically inform decisions for the future. Great. And it looks like we are at time. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we will be sending around a link to this video um, tomorrow morning. So you'll be able to tune in again if you'd like. Um, and thank you to Paige, Sharon, and Ryan for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you Thanks for having us. Bye everyone. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye.